epilepsy warning for flashing lights and colors. A few years ago, we talked about some extinct roller coaster models no longer in operation. In terms of thrill rides in general though, there are plenty of unique models that can't be ridden anymore. For this video, I thought it would be interesting to let my viewers vote on which extinct attraction is the most interesting and unique. So as voted on by the fans, here are the top 10 extinct flat rides you can't ride anymore. Number 10, The Witching Waves, built by American manufacturer Witching Waves Company. From the same inventor of, no joke, The Revolving Door, comes what can only be described as a bumper cars ride mixed with a wave pool. First opening at Brooklyn's Coney Island in 1907, this attraction seated guests in small two-person cars. Passengers navigated an oval-shaped course with a track consisting of moving metal sheets. Underneath these sheets were levers and gears that would move them in a wave-like pattern. These waves would propel the vehicles along the track, with the height of the waves varying throughout the course. While it was a unique concept for the time, its design was prone to mechanical issues. The constant bending of the metal plates and the complex system underneath them made this ride model expensive and difficult to maintain. The lack of seat belts and brakes also caused a number of injuries. Moreover, the innovation of electric-powered bumper cars soon made the model obsolete. Because of these issues, all Witching Waves models would cease to operate by the 1940s. Number 9. The Vertigo, made by Walter House. Who is Walter House? Well, he invented the famous Superloop ride, a favorite among carnivals and numerous Six Flags parks. Around the same time the Superloop debuted, House also invented another much more obscure flat ride. A ride so obscure I actually couldn't find any video footage of it. This ride named Vertigo was similar to the Superloop, but way more complex. Instead of a simple circular loop that the vehicle navigates back and forth, the Vertigo's oblong track actually moved in addition to the ride vehicle. Its middle rail would consist of protruding teeth, which would allow the operator to lock the vehicle in place and hang riders upside down. While I wasn't able to find video of this ride, it actually operated in quite a few locations, including the Canadian National Exhibition and the Ohio State Fair. Larson International, who also manufactures House's Superloop ride, would go on to create what appears to be a spiritual successor with their Crazy Train model. This model is extremely similar to the Vertigo, though the track rotates on a longitudinal axis instead of the lateral axis. Nowadays, you can still find Crazy Trains at various carnivals, but as for the Vertigo, its history remains largely obscure. If you have any information about this mysterious attraction, feel free to leave a comment down below. Number 8. The Hero Light, made by Spanish manufacturer Teproyel SL. Ever since first mentioning it in my Insane and Unique Carnival Rides video, a lot more information has been revealed about this problematic attraction. In the mid-90s, Teproyel had recently started building thrill rides. Two particular concepts they put on the market were the Hero Light and the Hero Max. Hero is the Spanish word for turn or twirl, and each model was a different variation of the same general concept. Both models consisted of a rotating structure that held a main arm at its center axis. At the end of this arm was another L-shaped arm that rotated sideways all while barrel rolling the gondola. The Hero Light had one gondola, while the proposed Hero Max would have had a gondola on each side of the arm. Either way, the model's design was both complex and chaotic. Unfortunately, the ride's complexity would lead to its downfall. Teproyel had little experience when it came to designing thrill rides, and the Hero Light had some critical design flaws. Only one of these rides was ever sold, being purchased by showman Jean-Joël Beau. Just two years after purchasing the ride though, Beau would encounter numerous technical flaws, which hampered its operation at fairs he sold it to. Not only that, but they potentially endangered the safety of the riders. Bo alleged that the ride suffered from mechanical and structural damage, including cracks in the welding and the ribs. Bo would end up filing a lawsuit against Teproyel and their insurance provider. After a legal battle, the court would rule against Teproyel, and their insurance provider was ordered to pay over 750,000 euros in damages to Bo. Believe it or not, Bo still has this ride in storage today. However, he reportedly has no intention of ever operating it again due to safety concerns. Number 7. The Flight Trainer, made by Swiss manufacturer Intamin. Imagine taking the Magic Kingdom's Astro Orbiter and seriously beefing up the intensity. 
First opening in 1989, this attraction consisted of a rotating wheel attached to a main tower. Connected to the wheel were 20 arms with a two-person pod on each end. Passengers could flip the pods sideways as well as raise and lower them with the use of an onboard joystick. The concept was instantly successful, with seven being installed in just two years. The model would show up at high-profile parks like King's Island, King's Dominion, and Knott's Berry Farm. However, just two years after it debuted, a tragic accident would bring the model's installations to a halt. On June 9, 1991, a woman died after falling out of the flight trainer ride at King's Island. An investigation would reveal a serious design flaw. It was actually possible for a single rider to easily fall out of their restraint system if the vehicle was sideways. Although the ride would later reopen with safety modifications, no other flight trainers were purchased after the accident. New York's Rye Playland, who opened their flight trainer a week before the accident, would permanently close their attraction, later selling it to an unknown park in Kuwait. The ride model was eventually discontinued by Intamin, and it would grow more endangered over the 90s. In 2007, the last operating flight trainer would close at Japan's Seibuen Yuenchi, an unfortunate end for such a promising ride model. Number 6, The Sky Sling, made by American manufacturer SNS Power. What happens when you take a standard slingshot ride, give it six seats, and put tilting seats on it? You get by far one of the most unique flat rides of all time. First introduced under the name Absolutely Insane, this ride model seated guests in a triangular ride vehicle suspended by three cables. Each cable was connected to one of three massive towers. Passengers were strapped in by their chests and seated on small saddles. After the boarding process, the vehicle would lift up a bit before compressed air launched it into the air. As passengers reached the top, their seats would freely tilt downwards, forcing them to face the ground. The vehicle then descended back to earth, coming to a swift but well-controlled stop. Upon its introduction, the ride was installed at several high-profile parks. Memorable installations included Thrill Shot at Six Flags Magic Mountain and Vertigo at Cedar Point. Unfortunately, the latter would suffer a catastrophic structural failure in the 2002 off-season. That January, one of the towers would collapse due to windy conditions causing vortex shear. The park had taken the ride vehicle off for the season, so there was nothing to connect the towers and absorb the vibration. This incident turned parks off from purchasing more of these rides, and several would close. Soon afterwards, SNS debuted a new variation of the model named the Sky Sling. This model still featured tilting seats, but with a lap bar restraint system. It was, in fact, the same seat and restraint system they used on their Screaming Squirrel Coaster model. However, it was also possible to have both standard seating and the old saddle seating, such as this ride at SNS's own Celebration Center in Utah. While a few of these rides were sold, the model still presented problems. At Six Flags Great Adventure, their Sky Sling named Eruption would be frequently closed for maintenance. On one occasion, the vehicle actually hit one of the towers while in motion. It was a minor strike, but still a safety hazard nonetheless. It also didn't get that high of a ridership, with more people interested in watching it than riding it. Soon enough, the ride was discontinued by SNS, and none remain operating. However, its likeness was preserved in the game Roller Coaster Tycoon 3, where it's an available ride choice under the same name. This is just further proof of how the developers of that game did their homework. Number 5, The Tumbler, made by American manufacturer Chance Rides. To put it simply, this ride is like something out of the Centrifuge Brain Project. Essentially, this attraction is an upgraded version of Chance's Skywheel ride. It's your girl Heather again, stopping by for a quick correction. Theme park crazy meant to say Skydiver and not Skywheel. The Skywheel is a double Ferris wheel made by Chance Rides, and a much tamer ride experience. It features the same exact gondola as that guests can rotate with a steering wheel. But instead of just one rotating wheel, the tumbler features two wheels connected by a rotating boom structure. Each wheel had 22 person pods, meaning the ride could accommodate up to 80 people per ride cycle. Even though each wheel had to be unloaded separately, this still made it a high capacity attraction in every sense. Despite this though, only one of these models was ever produced. In 1968, the ride would open at Six Flags Over Georgia under the name Wheelbarrow. Later on, it would be moved to New York's Rye Playland and the state's famous Coney Island in Brooklyn. Unfortunately, its massive scale and complexity made it subject to numerous technical issues, like other rides on this list. 
As a whole, it was said to rarely operate during its lifetime. After sitting in pieces by Coney Island's old Thunderbolt coaster, the tumbler was sold for scrap in the mid-1980s. Photos and video of this attraction are rare, but as I always say, we're lucky to have it documented. Number 4. The Sky Swatter, made by SNS Power. Also known as the Sky Swat, this was one of the first flat rides ever designed by the company. The ride first debuted at SNS's Utah Testing Facility in 2002, and it was fully operational there. The new attraction was sold straight off the testing grounds to Six Flags Astroworld in Houston, Texas, where it would open in 2003 as SWAT. Two years later, another Sky Swatter was sent to England's Thorpe Park, debuting under the name Slammer. The ride resembled a giant double-ended fly swatter, hence the model's name. On each side, 24 people sat in four rows of six passengers. After being lifted up the main structure, the main arm would rotate, flipping guests upside down. The most terrifying thing about this ride by far were the near-miss moments with the ground. During the course of the ride, guests would approach the ground head first, making them feel like they would crash right into it. It was truly something to behold and a memorable sight to see. After Astroworld's closure in 2005, SWAT was moved to Six Flags New England for the 2006 season. No matter where the Sky SWATs operated though, the model would face numerous technical issues. Passengers often got stuck on the ride, with its oversensitive safety system bringing the arm to a halt. Another common concern was the restraint system. In order to make riders feel safer, an over-the-shoulder restraint system was used in addition to a lap bar. However, this was said to make the ride extremely uncomfortable, since the restraints were often pulled down too hard. While upside down, passengers' shoulders would press hard into the restraints, leading to soreness and discomfort. SNS never sold another Sky SWAT after the first two, likely due to maintenance issues. And as the final nail in the coffin, the company would discontinue the ride model in 2010. Soon afterwards, Six Flags New England would close their Sky SWAT after the 2012 season, with Thorpe Park closing theirs after 2016. Its spot at Six Flags New England is now used by the New England Skyscreamers Q area. Meanwhile at Thorpe Park, the main structure still sits on the property as Q decoration for their new Black Mirror Labyrinth walkthrough attraction. In all honesty, someone really should bring back this ride for its uniqueness alone. I'm sure that modern technology would make it a lot more reliable. Though interesting fact, this ride was actually more reliable towards the end of its lifespan at both parks. Go figure. Number 3. The Triple Giant Wheel Built by Austrian manufacturer Wagner Biro and designed by Intamin. This unique Ferris wheel design was truly a product of its time. The design got its start in the early 70s with the original giant double wheel design. The ride design consisted of a steel structure and a long pivoting arm with a Ferris wheel on each end. The wheels rotated as the arm pivoted around, adding a bit more flavor to the standard Ferris wheel experience. In 1976, a new variation of this model would open, which in simple terms, took this design from a Wendy's double to a triple. Yep, this ride had three wheels on its arm, officially being known as the Triple Giant Wheel. This ride was an opening day attraction at Marriott's Great America in both Illinois and California, where it would be known as Sky Whirl. This mesmerizing attraction was something you'd have to see to believe, and it gave the skyline some extra appeal. Its impressive capacity and massive appearance made it an instant hit among park guests. The one in California was even featured in a Hollywood movie. In Beverly Hills Cop 3, Eddie Murphy's character jumps between the gondolas to save two kids from falling to their doom. Apparently, this guy decided to mess with the controls, which somehow caused the ride's mechanics to spontaneously combust. It also somehow managed to make the gondola swing wildly, and even caused one of them to teeter and fall off. Yes, what a convincing effect this is. And also there was a George Lucas cameo. Anyway, while these rides were indeed popular attractions, they all suffered from one fatal design flaw. The arms were susceptible to water seeping inside of them. This caused heavy rusting, which was difficult and expensive to take care of. As a result, Wagner Biro's giant wheels would badly age over time. In 2004, the last double giant wheel closed at Australia's Wonderland Sydney. Also that year, the last triple giant wheel closed at Seibuen Yuenchi. Yes, the same park where the last flight trainer closed. Talk about a coincidence. Number 2. The Absoluter, aka Sound Factory. Made by German manufacturers Wieland Schwarzkopf and Gerslauer. 
When you think of the name Schwarzkopf, you may think of legendary roller coaster designer Anton Schwarzkopf. Believe it or not though, he wasn't involved in this ride's creation. Instead, it was the brainchild of his son Wieland Schwarzkopf. Wieland operated his own separate company, which was named after himself. His company mainly produced parts for his father's existing rides, although it did make a few attractions of its own. Around the mid-90s, Wieland would collaborate with fellow German manufacturer Gerslauer on several ride designs. One of these was a souped-up polyp-style attraction called the Absoluter. The first model was built in 1996, and around 1997, German showman company Kinsler purchased the attraction and started operating it on the fair circuit under the name Sound Factory. The attraction closely resembles a standard Schwarzkopf monster ride, with several arms attached to a rotating structure. But instead of the arms bearing stationary gondolas, the gondolas on the Absoluter flip back and forth, as well as rotating sideways. The multi-axis rotation, massive scale, and unusual green-lipped coke can in the middle made this perhaps the most memorable flat ride ever conceived. But as promising as it was, this ride suffered from many unspecified maintenance issues. Supposedly, the ride had cracks in the structure and operational issues due to the heavy looping gondolas. After just a few years on the fair circuit, the ride was put into storage and later modified by Gerslauer. It now operates under the name Parkour, giving guests a significantly different ride experience. The main difference with this ride are the new, less cumbersome looking seats. While they do still spin sideways, they no longer flip upside down. Still though, while the original Sound Factory experience is extinct, this attraction is often praised by funfair enthusiasts and the fact that it used to be the Sound Factory makes it a piece of history. Now for a quick honorable mention, Wagner Biro's Magic Arms Ride. This attraction is essentially a looping frisbee ride attached to the end of a rotating arm. While there's plenty of information of how the ride got started and its origins, its current whereabouts are unknown. Also, the exact same ride experience still exists in China. Chinese manufacturer Nanfang has manufactured a near exact copy of this ride, and it can still be ridden today. Number 1. The Flying Cars, made by German inventor George Cook. For this one, we're going all the way back to the 1950s to Chicago, Illinois' Riverside Park. Oh my god, it's called Riverview Park, not Riverside Park. I should be getting paid extra for this. This now defunct amusement park was home to a number of classic rides, but none were quite as unique as the surreal flying cars. This one-of-a-kind ride model was specifically designed for Riverview by German inventor George Cook. The design consisted of a massive rotating drum with rails lining the inside. On each rail was a floating clamp system and a miniature car that was capable of traversing the drum a full 360 degrees. The attraction was hugely popular upon its installation, but it was also extremely unsafe by today's standards. First of all, there was only one single seatbelt across the lap that held guests in. Also, there was no neck support on the seats, so passengers' heads could freely flop back and forth. The former issue led to the death of a passenger who failed to properly fasten a seatbelt and fell out at the top. This incident led to the sudden demise of the attraction, though not much else is known about it. Despite its obvious safety issues, it really was ahead of its time, paving the way for the Larson Superloop ride, among others. A concept like this does have potential with modern technology, and it would be interesting to see it replicated. But only time will tell if this concept is ever revived. Now it's time for the comment shoutout program. This is where I take three random comments from my past video and read them out. These comments come from my failed coasters video on Shockwave at Six Flags Great America. Glam Girl 2013 says, quote, Love this ride and my home park, making a trip there in a couple weeks. Mary Beta says, quote, This coaster used to bang your head around so badly. Take it from someone who's been on it. I'm actually glad they tore it down and replaced it with Superman. Even though the last time I rode Superman, I got stuck on it for about an hour, but still had a great day. And the Sonic Sean says, I actually rode Shockwave once, it beat me up really bad, and I signed one of the petitions to keep the wizard, so this is my fault. If you want to see your words in my next video, leave a comment down below and it may be selected. Please note though that inflammatory or spam comments will not be read. Thank you all so much, and if you want to support me on Patreon, you can do so once again at the link in the description.
Thanks for watching, everyone. Feel free to like, share, and subscribe. You can follow me on social media on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, or you can check out my website at themeparkcrazy.com. This is Theme Park Crazy, and I'll see you all next time.